first is going to be our study of the life of Noah, uh, called Faithful Living in a Faithless Generation. Then after that, we're going to look at the life of Daniel. Uh, and there we're going to be looking at character in the crucible. And then after that, we're going to be looking at the book of Acts. And I think what we'll be seeing, based on what the Lord's just kind of been leading my heart on, although I've preached those other three series at different times, uh, everything's shaping up completely differently uh, than what I've preached in the past. There'll be some things that are similar, but there's going to be a lot of differences based on current situations and current needs. But I think what we're going to see as we look at those three series is the practical application of a lot of the things that we've been looking at and seeing as we've been in this study on uh, Be Sober, Be Vigilant. So I'm very excited about what God's wanting to do. Uh, but you just be much in prayer for me as I try to put all the parts and pieces together uh, and, and try to tie these things up. But in the month of November, the intent, unless the, something happens and the Lord changes my mind, is we'll finish this up on Sunday night. And then after the Christmas season, we'll be looking at these other series to help us, like I said, kind of put meat on some of the bones uh, that we've been looking at. But in Ephesians chapter number 6, start reading in verse number 10. The Bible says this, Finally, my, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all, to stand. Stand, therefore, having your loins girt about with truth, and having on the breastplate of righteousness, and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And for me, that utterance may be given unto me, that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in bonds, that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Let's pray. My Heavenly Father, I come to you once again thanking you so much just for the privilege of being here. Father, how I thank you for uh, the faithfulness of the people that are here tonight. Father, I pray that you just use me to share the truths that you've burdened my heart with. May it help us and encourage us and, and, and Father, strengthen us uh, as, as we realize that we truly do have an adversary. And as the Bible tells us that he's uh, walking about seeking whom he may devour. So, Father, help us to be on guard and to help us to stand and having done all to stand. We ask it all in the sweet and precious name of Jesus. Amen. And amen. As we said last week, when we look at these 11 verses that we've read here tonight, we see three key thoughts. First of all, we must rely on our strength. We see that in verses 10 and 11. Then we see in verse number 12, we must understand the opposition that we face. And then starting in verse number 13 down through verse number 20, we see the need to prepare for battle. Now, the first thing that we have to understand as we looked at last week is that our strength is truly not our strength. What verses 10 and 11 are telling us here is that we have to allow the Lord to be our strength. And we do that by putting on the whole armor of God. Now, again, this is extremely important. It's Christ that fills us with his strength. But for that to happen, we have to do something. We must, without any hesitation, the Bible says, put on the whole armor of God. We also saw that we're to stand against Satan, where stand is a military term that literally means to stand your ground. In other words, the strength of Christ provided through the right application of the armor of God provide, that he provides us will allow us to not be driven back by the onslaughts of Satan, no matter how strong or how cunning or how deceptive they may be. And the Bible says in verse number 12 that the provision of the armor that we see here is the only way to overcome Satan and this powerful hierarchy of principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. But now tonight we move to the actual armor starting in, in verse number 13 down through verse number 20. 
in verse 13, we're once again charged with taking on the, or taking upon us or putting on the whole armor of God. We said this last week. It is the whole armor, not just individual pieces. You can't go into battle with Satan half dressed. Each component or each piece of this armor provides a critical and a strategic and an important element of the strength that Christ provides and that we're going to need if we're really going to withstand Satan. To neglect even one piece of that armor is to rob yourself of some of the strength that Christ provides. And we cannot defeat our adversary if we're not fully equipped and fully prepared to do battle. The word withstand that you see there in verse number 13 is related to the word stand that we talked about before. We're to stand our ground and the word withstand again shows that this is more than just a defensive kind of a view. The word withstand means to stand against or to actively oppose. It's an active term. We're to stand and we're to fight against the evil of this day. But again, it's only the armor that makes this possible. And in verse 14, we see the two pieces of the armor that we're going to look at tonight. And that's the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness. So let's begin our study by looking at this belt of truth. Now, the idea of a belt in New Testament times is kind of is a little bit different than what we think of today, even though there is a lot of similarity. Underneath the armor of a soldier, they wore a tunic, basically almost like an undergarment. And it fit, it had a hole uh, in the head and for the sleeves, and then it came down and would usually hit somewhere around the knee. And, and what the purpose of that undergarment or that tunic was, was to keep the metal or the leather uh, the rough leather from chafing the soldier as they were trying to move. And it, it was nothing for a Roman soldier in this time period to actually run 24 miles in a day in full gear. So this undergarment was actually there to prevent chafing and you know, add basically just kind of a layer of comfort. And so this tunic was like a large shirt, and, and, it was, and, and it had a, but because of that, it had a particular disadvantage. It was bulky, and it could get in the way. Can you imagine trying to do a 24-mile run or a 25-mile run in this thing that was just flopping everywhere? So the first thing that the belt did was to cinch up the tunic so that the rest of the armor would actually fit properly. In addition, if the soldier needed to move quickly or they needed to move freely in battle, the soldier would tuck the tunic and there were slits. And basically, from my understanding, depending on the tunic, there was either two or four slits at the bottom. And what you would do is you would take that tunic and you would bring it up in such a way that basically you were creating a pair of shorts and you would tuck it into that belt. And that's what it's talking about when it's talking about girt up your loins with truth. Is you're taking that undergarment and you're tucking it into this belt of truth so that you're actually prepared to move quickly or to move effectively or to be able to move into action at a moment's notice. Now, the belt served a few other purposes as well. Number one, you attached the breastplate to the belt to secure it to the soldier, and it kept the, the breastplate from banging around and moving around. Again, can you imagine having on this tunic, having on this belt even, but if you didn't have the breastplate attached to the belt, every time you run, what's that thing going to do? Flop, 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 right? So the belt was actually used to attach... Uh, the bre you attach the breastplate to the belt in order to keep it uh, tight and, and ready and so it wasn't loose and just flip-flopping around. And, and it was also the belt that was used to hold a sheath that you could put the sword or the dagger that you had for battle in it as well. So if a soldier, if you think about this, 
if a soldier got rid of his belt, you know, a lowly belt, if a soldier got rid of that belt, his breastplate wouldn't be secure, his tunic would trip him up, his sword would drop to the ground. In other words, if that's the kind of soldier you are, you're not going to be much use. So this belt was a very important, although seemingly small piece of armor, it was really a very important piece as well. And uh, <laughs> to be honest with you, and we've got some police officers here in the church, your belts provide a lot of the same kind of thing. A lot of things ride on that belt. Flashlights, the cuffs, you know, whatever else. All of the tools that you need. And so to go into on duty without your belt and all the things that that belt supplies, you'd be at a disadvantage. And the same thing is true for this belt as well. So when you look at this belt of truth, you see that this is an important part of spiritual warfare. To stand strong in the battle that we face as Christians, we have to know the truth. And we have to live by truth. Only in this way will the armor stay on. And only in this way will we, be, will we be protected in the battle. That's because the belt of the truth, like I said, keeps that breastplate of righteousness tight. And we'll talk about that here in just a few minutes. And it keeps things out of your way so that you don't get tripped up. And it also provides a place to attach your sword. Without truth. The truth, and without truth, we're easily tripped up by Satan's lies. Lies, no matter how big, or lies, no matter how small, are the things that destroy lives and relationships and futures. One little lie was what Satan used in the Garden of Eden to destroy the future of all mankind. As we said last week, the armor is our means of enrobing ourselves or covering ourselves in the strength of Christ. So the first thing that we have to understand is that the truth that's part of our armor is not a result of our character. It's not about us being truthful. Because the Bible even tells us, and it goes even to the, uh, the breastplate of righteousness, that our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. The Bible tells us that the heart of man is deceptive above all things. Who can know it? So this belt of truth is not about us. It's not about our being truthful. It's not about our truthfulness. So what is this truth that Christ gives us here? And the answer to that question is, is it's the truth of the Word of God. Now, you may be thinking, but now wait a minute. It just says a few verses down the pipe here that the Word of God is our sword, not our belt. And while the sword of the Spirit is the Word of God, the belt also represents the truth of the Scriptures as well. And the Word of God as our belt has an entirely different function than the Word of God as our sword. And we'll talk about that when we deal more with the sword as well. First of all, we have to understand that the truth really is, the word that it's talking about here really does tie to the Word of God. And we see that in several scriptures. Psalm 119, verse 160 says this. Thy word is true from the beginning. And every one of thy righteous judgments endureth forever. John 17, verse 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Then 2 Timothy 2.15 says, Study to show thyself approved unto God a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. And if you look at those three verses, you see three distinct functions of the truth of Scripture in our lives. First of all, there in Psalm 119 and verse 160, it shows us that since the word of God is the truth, and since the word of God really does endure forever, it has to be, it must be, the authority by which we live our lives. 
If the word of God is my authority, then the devil's not going to be able to easily lead me astray by appealing to the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye and the pride of life. He'll try to tempt me, but if the word of God is my authority, then I can know what Christ would have me to do when faced with temptation or faced with questionable things. Secondly, John 17 and verse 17 shows us that the word of God should be such a regular and constant part of our lives that it changes how we think and how we live. Sanctify them by thy truth. Thy word is truth. If my thinking is in line with the truth of Scripture, and if I try to live my life according to the Scriptures, then I become a much harder target for Satan to deceive with his lies. It's the same thing as cinching up and tucking in the tunic. I get stuff out of the way by allowing the Word of God to be the truth that changes my thinking and changes my life. I get things out of the way that can hinder my ability to fight. Psalm 119 verse 9 says, Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By, t- by taking heed thereto according to thy word. If you don't want to get tripped up easily by the attacks of Satan, then you need to understand that the Word of God needs to be such an important part of your life that it impacts the way you think, it impacts the way that you live, so that you can be prepared for the lies that Satan's going to throw your way. Thirdly, 2 Timothy 2 and verse 16 shows us that the way we attach this belt of truth around our waist so that we can fight the way that we need to is to study. To study the Word of God. How can I say that the Bible is my authority and my source of truth if I really don't have any idea what it says? How can the Bible sanctify me, change my way of thinking, and change my way of living if I never study it and I never learn from it? There are a few things that we need to understand about studying. One, reading the Bible is not the same thing as studying the Bible. It's not the truth. Now, don't get me wrong. uh, Reading the Bible every day is a wonderful thing. I'm not saying that it's not, so don't get me wrong. But there's a marked difference between reading the Bible and studying it. Reading it lets the Word of God fill your mind, but studying it is what allows it to change the way you live. That's why we spent so much time on Wednesday nights here helping people to understand easy ways not just to read the Bible, but to study it. Two, if the only studying you do is at church, Sunday school, worship service, Bible study, whatever, then the truth of the matter is you're ill-equipped to fight the battle. Roman belts were anywhere from about six to eight inches thick, okay? And if all the studying you're doing is when you're here at church, then you're wearing about half the belt that you need to wear. It's only about half as thick as it needs to be. And then thirdly, if you're not faithful to the house of God so that you can be taught, then your belt is even weaker still. Study takes time. It takes effort. But when study of the Scripture is an important part of your life, then the Word of God becomes what binds your life together so that you can stand against the attacks of Satan. It's the unifying piece, really, of the entire set of armor. But then we also see the breastplate of righteousness. Although the belt's important, You still need the rest of the armor, (laughs) so don't get me wrong. Paul's next descriptive element, and you have to understand, and can you imagine, and and, and this is Paul, just, you know, you see it all through his ministry. Paul spent a lot of his time, and especially during this time, when he wrote the book of Ephesians, he was in prison. He was under house arrest, but he was still under lock and key. And the way they kept him under lock and key was they kept him... Uh, chained to one soldier, maybe two. Now, can you imagine 
Paul's sitting here, he's writing this letter to the Ephesians and God's burden in his heart. And he looks up and he sees how this dude's dressed. And he's like, now I can use this. Especially when you go back and you look at Isaiah 59 and see that God had already given him the inspiration for it way back in the Old Testament. Go back and read Isaiah 59, you'll see what I'm talking about. And so he's sitting here and he's looking at these soldiers and he's going to get belt, you know, truth, breastplate, mm, yeah, righteousness. And again, if you go to Isaiah 59, you'll see where he gets that tie. But when we think of, and, and, and you know, Hollywood, bless their heart, have a tendency to really confuse us about the way things were. And I don't know that I've maybe seen one movie of Roman soldiers during that time period where the armor actually was right. Most of the time, what you see is these big, almost like a shield across their chest, right? And, you know, they're usually gold-looking, and they're real fancy. You know, if you ever saw the movie Cleopatra, uh, you know, and all those kind of things. You know what I'm talking about. That's not what those things look like. What it was, they were actually strips of metal, thin strips of metal. And they would overlap those strips, okay? And it would start at the shoulders. It would work all the way down. And it would tie here on the sides with leather straps. So you had, you know, front and back, you were surrounded by these overlapping pieces of metal, strips. Now, the reason that's important is because the overlapping gave the, the breastplate strength. Because one piece was laying across it like shingles on a house, right? So it would give it strength and protection. But the fact that they were individual pieces or individual strips allowed for flexibility and movement. If you moved, the armor moved with you because it had had the give that it needed. If you're just wearing one of them big old bulky things, it's just getting your way. So you have these strips of metal, and then they're tied together to protect you. And, they, and the strips would overlap to give the strength, but at the same time, it would allow for flexibility and it would allow it to be more lightweight so that you could fight or when you were on the move. It was intended to protect the vital organs, the lungs, the heart, and even the midriff where the liver and the intestines reside. If any of those things were pierced by an arrow or, or pierced by a spear, the soldier was as good as dead. If the wound didn't kill him, the infection would. So what is it about righteousness that acts as a breastplate to protect our vital organs, the guard of our insides, our conscience, our desires, and, and our will? Well, to answer that, you have to understand again that this righteousness is not our own moral integrity. Our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. Okay? Guess what? An era is going to go through a filthy rag how easily. So it's not our moral integrity. If I were, try, if I were to try and to stand before the onslaught of Satan's attacks by relying on how good a person that I am, then I can assure you I'm going to fall at the first dart. Even as great a man as the Apostle Paul said exactly the same thing in the book of Philippians. In Philippians 3, verses 4 through 7, Paul says this, Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. Circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Paul said, if you measured me against other people, it might seem like I had a lot of, go a lot of good things going for me. But when I look at Christ, I realize that I've got absolutely nothing good to stand on. But then he continues on. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things, but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ and be found in him. Get this, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that, or that righteousness, which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. 
Now, notice that last phrase. The righteousness which is of God by faith. What does that mean? Well, Paul is talking, very simply, Paul is talking about our justification as believers. Now, one of these days, whenever the Lord opens up and gives me peace and direction to do that, we're going to do kind of a, uh, a basic doctrine or a basic theology uh, study here at the church. But to give you an idea about justification, simply put, when we accept Christ as our Savior, more happens than just our forgiveness. Forgiveness takes away our sins, and it wipes the slate clean. But justification adds something. When we experience justification, not only am I forgiven, but the righteousness of Christ is put on my account. And when the Father sees me, he sees me as righteous, but he doesn't see it as my own righteousness. Instead, he sees me righteous in Christ. Now, remember how we said that the belt helps to anchor the breastplate and keep it from moving around. We talked about that a little earlier. Well, the combination of the truth of God's word and the, and the righteousness of Christ in my life work together in my sanctification. That's what Paul says again in Philippians chapter 2, verse 13. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. Christ's righteousness, coupled with the truth of the word of God, changes me on the inside as much as it protects me on the outside. It makes me want to be obedient to the truth of Christ and to do what he wants me to do. So the righteousness that he gives me works in my life to make me to be righteous in the way that I live. I get his righteousness and that in turn fuels my desire to be righteous. Okay? Now the question is, how does all of that help me fight Satan? We have to remember that Satan's favorite avenue of attack is the mind. Even when he attacks your body, what he's wanting to do is get inside your head. So his favorite avenue of attack is the mind. If he can confuse you or if he can corrupt your way of thinking, then ultimately your will and your body go along for the ride and will follow him into disobedience or discouragement or whatever it is. So these two pieces of armor provide two key elements that you need in your Christian walk. One is discernment. And the second is confidence. Discernment through the study of the Word of God allows you to spot the lies that Satan throws at you and you can see them for what they are. Attempts to get you to disobey God and dishonor His name. You need that discernment if you're going to be able to stand your ground. Okay? Now, think about this. I, I was, as I was studying, I don't know... God just kind of put this image in my mind and helped me see this. Can you imagine being the Native Americans when they first came in contact with European settlers and were shot at by a gun? They'd never seen such a thing. And because they had never seen such a thing, when those uh, musket balls began to fly, what did it do? Not only did he kill a lot of the natives, but it completely confused them. How do you fight against something that can shoot from a lot farther away and do a whole lot more damage than the little bow and arrows we've got? That's what happens to us as Christians so often. We don't spend time in the Word of God to know the weapons that Satan is using against us. And all of a sudden, he lets loose a volley, and we're completely ill-prepared for the attack because we don't have a clue how to deal with it. So the study of the Word of God gives us discernment 
understanding of what it is that Satan is trying to do, of what it is that Satan is using to try to get you to fall in battle instead of stand your ground. And one of Satan's favorite tactics to get you to stand down or to stand aside in spiritual warfare is, number one, to convince you that you're either not saved, which we'll talk about when we talk about the helmet of salvation, or he tries to convince you that God will never use you because of how sinful you are, that God will never use you because of how many bad things you've done in your past, or God will never use you because you've brought disgrace to God and that you're unworthy of even being called a Christian. Ever, devil ever done any of those to you? So beat on you to make you think that you, you know, God can't possibly love me and use me the way I've done. But the breastplate, and here's the other side. So you've got the discernment piece to understand the attacks, but then you've got the confidence piece that's found in the breastplate because the breastplate of Christ's righteousness gives you the confidence that you need to stand. Why? Because it's not confidence in your own goodness. It's confidence that Christ's perfect righteousness has been applied to you and that God sees you as righteous in Christ and not in yourself. And that knowledge, that knowledge that you're not standing in this battle in your own righteousness. Instead, you're standing in this battle in the righteousness of Christ allows you to absorb even the attacks of the devil without it permanently wounding you. Kind of like a bulletproof vest. You may get hit by that bullet. And you may get bruised. But you're not going to die. So the breastplate of Christ's righteousness gives you the confidence that even if you happen to miss one of those darts with the shield of faith, that it's not a fatal wound. Satan can't get inside your head and convince you that you're not good enough. He can't get inside your head and convince you that God doesn't want to have anything to do with you. He can't get inside of your head that because you failed this time that you're doomed for a life of failure as a Christian even if God would claim you as a Christian for the rest of your life because you're not standing in your own righteousness. You're standing in the righteousness of Christ. We've said that you need to put on the whole armor of God if you're going to stand against the attacks of Satan. So let me ask you something today. Are you a faithful student of the Word of God so that you can stand against Satan's attacks? Do you spend time not just reading, not, read, not just reading the Bible, not reading even the best of devotionals that's out there. But do you spend time studying so that you can spot the lies and deceptions of the devil? I'm a firm believer in reading the Bible. But if you're going to stand in the battle, you've got to be a student. I've got to be. A student of the Word of God. The second question, are you trusting in the righteousness of Christ so that you can withstand the assaults of the devil when he says you're too big a sinner or too small a Christian? Have you ever been there? Is he using that on you right now? Or are you standing with confidence because you know it's Christ's righteousness that God sees? And it's Christ's righteousness working in you to help you become more like him every day. The word of God gives you discernment. Recognizing that you have been covered in the righteousness of Christ can give you confidence for the battle.
key question is, are you relying on those two things tonight? Because it's the whole armor of God. Are you studying so that you can spot the attacks of the devil? And are you fighting in your own strength or in the confidence that you have in the righteousness of Christ instead of your own? As we stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, Brother Wallace comes to play softly. Father, <clears throat> I've shared what you'd have me to share tonight. And as we get into this armor, more and more we're going to...